detective sergeant. You're assigned to missing persons detail. A ten-year-old boy disappears from his home in a remote section of the city. Two nights and two days pass. There's not a trace of the boy. Your job, find him. Friends, compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. You'll find a world of difference. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties. Extra mild, superbly blended. To give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality. Even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. So compare Fatima yourself today. You'll find Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Buy Fatima. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, August 4th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Inspector Bowling. My name's Frank. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 2.25 p.m. when we got to Bowers Avenue, number 1218. Yes. Police officers, ma'am, would like to see Mr. Sherman? Oh, certainly, officers. Won't you come in? Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm Mrs. Keller from next door. I saw you around here yesterday. Yes, ma'am. Came over this morning to look after poor Mr. Sherman. Yes, ma'am. Well, how's he feeling today? Not too well. Fixed him some nice chicken broth for lunch, and then I helped him in his wheelchair and took him out in the backyard out in the sun. Good hot sun is wonderful for his legs. He has arthritis, you know. Yes, so we understand. What if we could talk to him, Miss Keller? Oh, yes, I guess you have to. He's still out in the back sleeping in his chair last time I looked. Seems a shame to disturb him. Well, he called us at the office, said he wanted to see us as soon as we could make it out here. Was it about his grandson, Jimmy? They found him yet? No, ma'am. Searching parties calling the area. There's still no trace of the boy. Did any of the other officers who were out here covering the neighborhood talk to you, Miss Keller? Oh, yes. There was uh, Mr. Lorman, Detective Lorman. Yes, ma'am. I told him everything I knew about Jimmy's disappearance. It was right after dinner hour on Monday, about 6.30, last time I saw Jimmy. I see. I came out the side door to empty the garbage, and I saw Jimmy hiking up the side of the hill there. Just in back of the house, all by himself. Nice boy. As far as you know, Mrs. Keller, Jimmy is Mr. Sherman's only living relative. That's right. His only relative, his only grandchild. Mm-hmm. Jimmy's mother and father were killed in an auto wreck. That was three or four years ago. Sherman's had a terrible lot of tragedy. Jimmy and his grandfather, they're the only ones left. You can't think of any reason why the boy would want to leave his grandfather, can you? None at all. Mr. Sherman's a wonderful man. Jimmy loved him. I knew that. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Keller, Mrs. Keller. Oh, that's Mr. Sherman. He's awake. We can go through the house out the back. Yeah? All right, ma'am. This way. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Visitors for you, Mr. Sherman. How are you feeling? All right, I suppose. Hello, Sergeant. How are you, Mr. Sherman? What about the boy? Have you found him yet? Well, nothing yet, Mr. Sherman. We've added more men to the searching party. We're doing everything we can. Gone two nights and two days. Tell me the truth, Sergeant. What's happened to the boy? Well, right now, we don't know any more about it than you do, sir, but that's no reason to give up hope. You told us yourself yesterday that Jimmy's been missing once before. It turned out all right that time. He wasn't gone for two nights and two days. Maybe you just say I'm old and I've got funny ideas, but I got a feeling, Sergeant, something's happened to Jimmy. 
Something's happened, and I can't do anything about it. You just put those thoughts out of your head, Mr. Chairman. They're going to find Jimmy, and it's going to be all right. Why don't you pull up those lawn chairs there, Sergeant? All right. I'm going to go in the house and fix some cold lemonade for you, man. Well, thank you, ma'am. We got your phone message at the office, Mr. Sherman. Anything special you wanted to talk to us about? Yes, there was something. When you were talking to me yesterday... Yes, sir. I told you that Jimmy had on a brown jacket when he disappeared Monday night. Yeah. I was wrong, Sergeant. We found the jacket in his room. All he was wearing was a pair of blue jeans and his white sweatshirt. Do you think that might help any? Yes, sir, it might. We'll send out a supplementary description of his clothes. We'll see that everybody's notified. Just wish I could be out there with a searching party. Arthritis is pretty bad today. Caught me at a terrible time. Don't know what I'd do if anything happened to the boy. I know we've asked you this before, Mr. Sherman, but can you think of any reason at all why your grandson would want to leave home? No, sir, no reason at all. Those two collie pups over there in the pen. Jimmy just bought them last week with his own money. Saved up to get them. I see. The boy's crazy about dogs. That's why I say he just wouldn't pick up and leave everything. Boy and me, not along fine. No reason for it, Sergeant. Something's happened to the boy. I just got a feeling. Officer? Yes, ma'am? Uh, telephone call for either one of you. I get it, Ben. I'll be right back. You're right. The man said it was your office calling. Thank you, Miss Keller. Where's the uh, phone? Telephone's straight back there in the hall. Thank you very much. Friday talking. Oh, did they find something? Yeah, in the Elysian Park area by the upper reservoir. Uh-huh. Found a pair of kids' trousers right by the edge of the water. What kind of trousers? Blue jeans, nothing in the pockets. They'll start dragging for a body as soon as they get the equipment. Check it out with a grandfather, huh? See if the boy was in the habit of hiking up there around the reservoir. Right. We'll call in just before we leave here. Right, Joe. Right, bye. Sergeant, just caught it for you. Nice and cold. Thank you, ma'am. What was it, Sergeant? Something about the boy? Well, nothing definite, no, sir. Just a report on the search party. They're still up in the Elysian Park area. Oh, I see. Did your grandson, Jimmy, do much hiking in that neighborhood up there, Mr. Sherman? Yes, I think he did. Likes to hike up there around the reservoir. Why? The name on the 316 report, Missing Juvenile, read... James Philip Sherman, WMA, 10 years old. He lived with his 68-year-old grandfather, Oscar Sherman, in a small cottage in a sparsely populated section of the city. Shortly after 6 p.m. on Monday, the boy went outside to play. When darkness fell and he failed to return home, his crippled grandfather went out to look for him. Half an hour later, the neighbors joined in in the search. No sign of the boy. At 10 p.m., Juvenile Bureau was notified, and throughout the night, squads of men on foot and cruiser cars canvassed the area. A local broadcast and an all-points bulletin was gotten out on the boy. Neither the grandfather or the neighbors could find any reason for his disappearance. After almost 48 hours of continuous searching, the only lead we had was the pair of trousers found on the edge of the upper reservoir in Elysian Park. They were shown to the grandfather, but he failed to give positive identification. Dragging operations at the reservoir began immediately. Meantime, Ben and I, together with Lorman and Lopez from Homicide, checked out every possible lead on the missing youngster. One of the tips came from a Frank Grady, an unemployed carpenter who lived five blocks from the Sherman home. I don't know how much this may be worth to you, Sergeant. I don't want to get anybody into trouble, but I figured this is a pretty important thing. Well, what is it you want to tell us, Mr. Grady? Well, as I say, I don't want to get anybody in any trouble, but... Have you checked over everybody in this neighborhood? I think we've talked just about everybody in the area, don't you, Joe? Well, either us or the man from Homicide. Why do you ask, Grady? Well, there's a guy who's down the street there, right down the corner from this house. Old guy by the name of Gilby. What about him? As I say, I don't want to cause any trouble, but maybe you ought to double-check him. One thing, he's an ex-convict, I know that. Another thing, he hates everybody in the neighborhood. Hates the kids, too. Wouldn't be surprised if he was your man. Why do you say that, Grady? Does he have any special reason for disliking the Sherman boy? Oh, man, Gilby wouldn't need a reason. A real queer one. Say, I got a couple cans of cold beer in the icebox, and I fix you fellas up. Well, no, thank you. Just the same. 
What makes you think this Gilby had anything to do with the boy's disappearance, Mr. Grady? Well, number one, I saw old man Gilby out walking Monday night when the Sherman kid disappeared. Yeah? So I'm walking along the road up there. The same one that goes up by the reservoir. And I watched him. It was dark by the time he got back to his house. I'd check on him again if I were you. As far as you know, has Gilby ever been in trouble for bothering the kids in the neighborhood? Well, Sergeant, he bothers everybody in the neighborhood. Real queer, lives by himself, always complaining about something. Frankly, I think he's your man. I think he took that kid and he did something to him. Well, do you have anything at all to back up your opinion? You dig around, you'll find something on him. He's no good and I'll bet on it. I've had a couple of run-ins with him myself. He just isn't any good, that's all. Well, all right, Grady. Thanks for the tip. We'll be sure and double-check on the man. You won't tell him where you got the tip, though, huh? Like I say, I've had run-ins with him before. It might cause trouble. No, he won't know where we got it. Thanks again. Okay, Sergeant. It's a pretty important thing. I didn't want to make anybody look bad, but the old man's just no good. Now, you understand that, don't you? Sure, Grady. We understand. <laughs> As a matter of routine, we double-checked on Grady's neighbor, uh, Mr. Harold Gilby. We found out that he had no jail record and that he had been at work on Monday from 3 to 11 p.m. He could have had no direct connection with the Sherman boy's disappearance, no more than Grady himself could have had. The so-called tip he'd offered us was like a hundred other phony leads in a hundred other cases. Spiteful, small-minded neighbors trying to use a tragic situation to work out their jealousies and prejudice on somebody that they didn't get along with in the neighborhood. The search continued. So did the hot weather. Friday, August 6th, no sign of the missing boy. The temperature climbed into the mid-90s. Dragging operations at the reservoir went on. Saturday, August 7th, more legwork, more hot weather. By noontime, Ben and I had run down the last lead we had on 10-year-old Jimmy Sherman. Went nowhere. 1 p.m., we headed back for the office to check with Inspector Bowling. These are the days when I wish I had a little swimming pool in my backyard. It would be nice to go home to. Yeah, well, I'll save your money. Oh, it doesn't cost so much. No, I read in a magazine where a fellow built his own pool for $95.37. It can't be much of a pool, can it? Oh, yeah, it's good size. Of course, he did all his own labor. Had all his friends in to help out. Well, he must have had a lot of friends, didn't he? Yeah, he did after he finished the pool. Righty, Ben. Hi. Oh, hi, Skipper. How'd you two make out? Anything? I don't know luck at all. That makes it unanimous. Did you hear about the old man, the boy's grandfather? No, what happened? I guess the strain got too much for him. He collapsed. They're moving him to a hospital. Oh, oh that's too bad. Right. Are our men still up there dragging that reservoir? Finished this morning. Nothing. Well, how about the search party? Nothing there either, I suppose. No, not a trace of the boy. It's a blind alley all the way around. How about the APB, the radiogram? Had three replies so far. None of them panned out. Uh, you want grab it? Juvenile Bureau of Bowling. Yeah, Fred. Mm-hmm. No good, huh? Yeah, all right. Check you later. I heard it once. I heard it 50 times. No trace of the boy. Yep, me, Skipper. Something real weird about the whole thing. Well, now, look. We know he didn't just disappear into thin air. Kid's gone. There's a good reason for it. There's got to be an answer somewhere. That's right. You'll find it. Another week passed, and then a month, two months. We were no farther along than the day we started on the case. In November, we had a teletype from Chief Earl Eau Claire of the Phoenix, Arizona Police Department. Reportedly, the Sherman boy had been seen in Phoenix. It was another false alarm. The Christmas holidays wore on into a new year. February came and went, then March and April. Tuesday, May 3rd, 1.40 p.m., Ben and I got a call to check in with Inspector Bowling. This telegram just came in from Dayton, Ohio. Have a look. Thank you. Let's see, Joe. What is it? Jimmy Sherman. They found him. Nine months had gone by, almost to the day since the Sherman boy had disappeared. The grandfather was contacted immediately. When he was told his grandson had been found and that he was safe, the old man was unable to answer. He broke down and wept. In our communications with the Dayton, Ohio police, they told us that the boy had been found wandering along a highway just outside that city and that he'd appeared to be in a kind of a dazed condition. The boy told the Dayton officers that he'd been kidnapped a short distance from his home in Los Angeles by a man in a blue sedan. He gave them detailed descriptions of both the man and the car. He told them that for the past nine months, the man had held him prisoner. 
driving from state to state, never letting the boy out of his sight. He said the kidnapper told him on several occasions that he was holding him for ransom and that he was waiting to get money from his grandfather. On May 8th, the youngster was returned to Los Angeles and reunited with his grandfather. On May 10th, we got a call from the grandfather that he wanted to talk to us. Ben and I drove out to see him. Come right in, officers. Glad to see you. How are you, sir? Hi, Mr. Sim. Sorry to cause you all this trouble chasing you out here like this. Not at all, sir. What is it you want to see us about? Well, I'm not really sure about it, Sergeant. That's the whole thing of it. I don't know if it's me or what it is. What's bothering you, Mr. Sherman? It's the boy, Jimmy. I don't know what to think. Well, how do you mean, sir? He's all right, isn't he? We saw him as we drove up playing out in the backyard, and the doctor checked him over. No, it's it's not that. The boy's healthy enough. Nothing wrong with him. Well, then what is it, sir? Maybe it sounds a little weird to you, but I'm just not sure. You're not sure of what? That boy out there, Sergeant. I'm not sure he's really my grandson. You are in the communications division of the Metropolitan Police Department, the teletype room. Forty-three LOS five twenty-nine fifty-one, twelve o three p.m. APB. WMA one fifty five foot six, dark hair, dark eyes, wearing gray suit, no hat. Suspect is wearing glasses. Heavy build, twenty-two years. Suspect is armed with blue steel revolver. Any information? Forward. You have just heard a teletype description of a suspect. This information will apply to many, but careful screening will eliminate all but one. You'll find the same is true when you examine king-size cigarettes. Careful screening will eliminate all but Fatima. Compare Fatima. Fatimas are the same length as any other king-size cigarette, 85 millimeters. Fatima has the same circumference, one and one-sixty-fourths inches around. And Fatima filters the smoke exactly the same long distance as other king-size cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Fatima gives you extra mildness. A much different, much better flavor and aroma. You get all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. So compare Fatima yourself. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Best of all, long cigarettes. Tuesday, May 10th, 2 p.m. When the aging grandfather, Oscar Sherman, told us that he wasn't sure whether the recovered boy was really his grandson, Ben and I didn't know what to think. Our first reaction was that the shock of recovering the boy after he'd almost been given up for lost had been too much for the old man. Mr. Sherman admitted that there was no physical difference in the boy as far as he could see, but he still insisted that there was something wrong, that the boy seemed different somehow. To satisfy the grandfather, Ben and I talked to the boy, but he failed to give us any reason to believe that he was not Jimmy Sherman. We checked with the boy's friends, all the people in the neighborhood who'd known Jimmy over a period of years. They confirmed our opinion. A few thought that the youngster had changed a little, but no one had any serious doubts about it. The boy was really Jimmy Sherman. So the matter was dropped. Thursday, May 12th, Ben and I had lunch, and then we checked back in at the office. Joe, want to grab that? Yeah, I'll get it. Juvenile Bureau, Friday. Sergeant, this is Mr. Sherman talking. Yes, sir. Mr. Sherman? Yes, sir. How are you? I want you to come out and take this boy, Sergeant. He's not my grandson. I'm sure of it. Well, how do you mean, sir? This boy's got a scar on his side. He's had his appendix on. Yes, sir. My grandson never had an operation in his life. Before we left the office, Ben and I briefed Inspector Bowling on the phone call from the grandfather, then we drove back to the Sherman house. While Oscar Sherman didn't claim that he knew his grandson's complete medical history, he was certain that the boy had not had his appendix out and that he had not had an operation. He told us that his neighbor, Mrs. Keller, could substantiate that, that she had known Jimmy since he was a baby. We put in a call to the Sherman's family doctor. He wasn't in. We left a message, and then we went next door to see Mrs. Keller. We found her in the kitchen washing dishes. I just got a couple more to rinse. Can you wait a minute? Yes, ma'am. Of course you can. Uh, 
No, to tell you the truth, Sergeant, I just don't know what to think about Mr. Sherman. Maybe the whole thing was too much for him. His mind's going back on it. Well, to your knowledge, Mrs. Keller, was the boy ever operated on? No, not as far as I know. But it's possible he did have an operation. I didn't hear about it. Sergeant, as far as I'm concerned, that boy's Jimmy Sherman. I don't know what his grandfather's up to with all that silly talk. Well, if it's not really the boy, we won't have too much trouble finding the truth. There's no question in my mind. Of course it's Jimmy. Why, when he was over here the other day, he talked about the party I gave for him one Halloween. He even remembered the children who were there. Mm -hmm. Are the other neighbors as sure about the boy as you are? Just about. Miss Foster down the street, Jimmy was in to see her yesterday. He talked about some changes she'd made in her living room. Asked her about some relatives she has living out of town. Mm Mm-hmm. Come to think about it, Jimmy even remarked on that new trailer rose I planted out in front. Besides, as the boys' dogs, why, they knew that youngster the minute he set foot in the yard. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Keller. If we have any more questions, we'll contact you, all right? All right, Sergeant. Couldn't fix you a cup of coffee, could I? Oh, oh no, you. thanks, Mrs. Keller. Take time now. Poor old Mr. Sherman. I don't know what to make of it. He's so mixed up. Yes, ma'am. So are we. We left the neighbor, Mrs. Keller, and went back next door to the Sherman house. The grandfather told us that the family doctor hadn't returned our call yet. At 3.30 p.m., the boy came home from school, changed his clothes, and went out into the backyard to play. We figured we had nothing to lose in talking to the boy again. We found him in the small workshop at the rear of the garage where he was sawing on a piece of plywood with a hacksaw. We talked to him for about 20 minutes. It was no different than the first time we interviewed him. He was relaxed and talkative. Say, would you hand me that hammer there, officer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here you go. Thanks. Boy, if I ever get this thing finished, it's going to be the best coaster around here. These are the wheels I'm going to put on it. Pretty good, aren't they? Yeah, they look fine, son. You like building things, coasters and things like that? Oh, yeah, I like it all right. It's fun. Your granddad says you've changed quite a bit since you got back, Jim. Says you didn't like working around the shop here before. Well, I guess I don't really. You know, once in a while I like to come out and fool around. Mm Mm-hmm. Have you seen Mr. Barlow down the street since you've been back? Mr. Barlow? Um, No, I went down to see him, but he wasn't home. Maybe I'll go down and see him tomorrow. His name isn't Barlow, is it, Ben? I thought it was Robinson. Oh, yeah, that's right, Mr. Robinson. Sometimes I forget How do you and your grandfather get along, Jim, all right? Oh, sure, every once in a while. Looks kind of funny at me. I don't know. I guess he's still worried about that man taking me away, you know, and all. Uh-huh. How have you been feeling lately, Jim? Okay? Sure, I feel fine. Hardly ever get sick. That's good. You ever been in the hospital, son? Uh-huh, just once. Had my appendix out. I hate hospitals. Uh, can I have that can of nails there, please? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here you are. Got to make this good and strong, you know. I'd like to ask you a question, son. Yeah? What's your real name? I'm Jimmy Sherman. You know that. No, oh, I'd like to have the truth, son. Who are you? You must be fooling, officers. You know who I am. Jimmy Sherman. No, Jimmy Sherman never had his appendix out, son, but you did, and you've got a scar to prove it, haven't you? Sure, I had my appendix out. Ask my grandpa. He'll tell you. I'm afraid he won't soon. He says he's not your grandfather. He says you don't belong here. His grandson never had an operation in his life. How about it, son? You want to tell us about it? Oh, Grandpa isn't feeling well. He doesn't know what he's saying. Well, he knows you're not his grandson. Now, come on. What about it, son? All right. I'm not Jimmy Sherman. told us his real name was Donald Rush. He said he'd run away from his home in Springfield, Ohio, two weeks before. He said that he'd been picked up by the police on a highway just on the outskirts of Dayton, Ohio. On returning the boy to the station, the police officer saw that he fitted the description of the missing California boy perfectly. It was almost as if the two were identical twins. Under the impression that the youngster was suffering from shock or amnesia, the police officers told him all about his home and his friends in California. They gave Donald Rush all the information that they had on the missing Sherman boy. All the newspaper stories, pictures, the dozens of teletypes and circulars which had been sent across the country in an effort to locate the missing youngster. 
On his way out to California on the train, the rush boy was given dozens of newspapers to read, which contained thousands of words concerning the disappearance of Jimmy Sherman. So, by the time he got to Los Angeles, Donald Rush knew everything he had to know about the boy he was impersonating. We questioned the Ohio youngster further. Besides an exceptionally high IQ, he admitted to having an almost photographic memory. We took him in the house to face the grandfather of the boy that he'd been impersonating, the boy who was still missing. Mr. Sherman. Yes, Sergeant. Sit down, won't you? The boy here has a confession for you. He wants to tell you himself. I think I know. I was right all along, wasn't I, sir? I didn't mean anything by it, mister. I just thought it'd be fun to make out like I was somebody else for a while. You wouldn't know the difference, would you, sir? No, sir, I'm afraid I wouldn't. That picture over there on the mantel, and the boy here, they look exactly alike to me. There's only one thing I'd like to know, sir. Yeah? Why'd you do it? Why'd you try and fool me? I don't know, mister. I ran away from home, and the cops picked me up near Dayton. He thought my name was Jimmy Sherman. They said I was a missing kid from California. Well, why didn't you straighten him out right then, son? I was kind of afraid. If I told him what my real name was, they would have sent me back home. So I'd just let him think I was really Jimmy Sherman. They seemed to be pretty sure I was. How long did you think you could keep it up, son, pretending you were somebody else? I don't know. I guess I never thought much about that. I got here and everybody was nice to me. I just didn't think about anybody finding out. Honest, mister, I didn't mean to do anything wrong. I didn't mean to hurt anybody. And you never saw my grandson? You never saw Jimmy? No, sir. I just got on the train and they brought me out here. <laughs> you don't know where he is? You don't know how he is? All right, try to take it easy, Mr. Sherman. Why would you do it, boy? You're a stranger. Why would you try to fool me about Jimmy? I'm sorry, mister. I didn't mean it. Must I didn't mean it. <laughs> Lord, I haven't <laughs> Come on, Ben. Let's go, son. I didn't want to make him cry like that, Sergeant. Honest, I'm sorry. Couldn't you just let me stay here with him? No, I'm afraid not, son. I won't do anything wrong. Don't you think I could just stay here with him? I'll go right back in there now and tell him I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry too, youngster, but you're not the boy he's looking for. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On Wednesday, May 20th, the meeting was held at the Juvenile Bureau, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that meeting. And now, here's our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, I hold in my hand a new pack of Fatimas. All I need to prove that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Now here on the side, you'll find this statement. Fatima contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. So tomorrow, buy a pack of Fatimas. I know you'll find that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Donald Rush, who impersonated missing 10-year-old Jimmy Sherman, was returned to the custody of his parents at their home in Springfield, Ohio. Four months later, the body of Jimmy Sherman was discovered buried on a farm on the outskirts of Riverside, California. The boy had been murdered. His killer, a farmer in the neighborhood, was subsequently apprehended and brought to trial. He was found guilty of murder in the first degree and was executed at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, is brought to you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counterspy, next of the most NBC stations.